Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Horse Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. This is the second half of our spoiler-free discussion where we are talking about all the horror movies we watched this year that came out in 2020. At the end of this episode, we will also be sharing our favorite and least favorite horror movies of 2020. So let's get to it. What's our first movie, Sharon? All right. We talked about this briefly in a previous episode, um, but this just came out not too long ago. Freaky, starring Vince Vaughn and Catherine Newton. Uh, She is also in Three Billboards and Big Little Lies. It's directed and co-written by Christopher Landon, who is the writer of Happy Death Day to You and the Paranormal Activity movies, uh, the second, third, and fourth one. He also directed Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You and the Paranormal Activity movie, The Marked Ones. Um, So he's been pretty busy and he's got a good hand in some of the most popular horror movies of the past decade. Um, So after swapping bodies with the deranged serial killer, a young girl in high school discovers that she is less than 24 hours before the change becomes permanent. So a little bit of trivia. The original name of the film was supposed to be Freaky Friday the 13th. Uh, Also, there are some nods to some classic horror movies. At the football game, uh, one of the characters, Booker, his last name is Strode. Obviously, we all know that that is a reference to uh, Laurie Strode from Halloween. And the Blissfield Butcher, which is, which is the name of the serial killer played by Vince Vaughn, he wears a mask in the movie that vaguely resembles the hockey mask worn by Jason Voorhees. So you have not seen this yet, no. Mindy? Okay. No, I haven't. Um, Definitely recommend this movie. It's just so much fun. And as I think I mentioned previously, mm-hmm. when we talked about this in our other episode, seeing Vince Vaughn playing a teenage girl was just amazing. I mean, he's just a really funny, com- he's just a really good uh, comedic actor in general. Um, and he's very surprisingly good at playing a teenage girl. Uh, likewise, seeing Catherine Newton, who is like this cute little petite young woman, having to embody a character that is supposed to be like this big six foot something, <laughs> probably around 200 pound male serial killer. Like she fucking nailed it. Um, there was a lot of great kills in the movie that were pretty unique. I've never seen a death by wine bottle or toilet before. Ooh. So, um, Props to those kills. Um, (laughs) And besides the main plot, there was also a subplot with Millie, who plays the teenage girl, the main star of the movie, and and the rest of her family that's, like, just very heartwarming and relatable. And it added a bit of dimension to not only her character, but also the film in general. So it's not just a body swap movie. There's more layers to it than that. So definitely recommend. Cool. Yeah, I actually really like Paranormal Activity, the marked ones, but I also don't because like it's one of the most well written and directed movies from that series. But it also is depressing as fuck because you get to know all these characters that you like and you know they're all going to die. But that said, at first I was kind of like, how ridiculous is this going to be and will I be able to take it? But I think this sounds fun. So I'm definitely going to watch this. Cool. Okay, so speaking of oddly unique movies that I kind of think that maybe you should maybe try also, Sharon, um, is Followed. Uh, It is the directorial debut of Antoine Lee, uh, and the writer of this movie was Todd Click, stars a a bunch of folks that I don't know, but I'm kind of curious to find out what they're going to do next, basically. Uh, Stars newcomers Matthew Solomon and Tim Dreyer with a very special cameo appearance from John Savage, who is a big time character actor with an insane resume dating back to the 60s and 70s, including the films Deer Hunter, Thin Thin Red Line, and again, fucking HBO's Carnival, where he actually played the foil to Clancy Brown's character that we mentioned 
in the last episode. I don't know why that show keeps showing up in the 2020 horror movies. Um, I always said that this guy is such a good character actor that if Twin Peaks season three needed a, to have Bob physically on the show, that Savage would have been a fantastic villain for Frank Silva. Savage actually did appear in uh, part 13 of season three as a random detective. So that's a little fun trivia for you. So nobody grown because this is found footage, but I fucking loved this. The basic plot, follow, it introduces us to aspiring social media influencer, quote, drop the mic, all one word, each one, each word capitalized. That's when, the character's name is drop the mic. That is the blogger's like handle. Gotcha. Um, his name's Mike. When he is offered the opportunity to get a nice stack of cash for sponsorship of his channel, he's joined by his film crew on a visit to one of the most haunted hotels in America. While there, he expects to have a horrific night of thrills and scares. What begins as a fun investigative challenge quickly descends into a personal hell of true evil, begging the timely question, how far would you go to pursue internet fame? All right, I'm just going to say this once to both of you. Uh, I don't care what the price. We are never fucking staying in a haunted-ass place. Like, I'm talking Cecil Hotel Haunted for a paid sponsorship. We all know nothing good can come of that. Just getting that out there. Okay, Sharon Spencer? I'm vetoing that decision now. (laughs) Fuck it. No, absolutely not. Despite having just said that, um, one good thing that did come out of folks attempting that fictionally i guess is this movie i actually thought it was kind of creepy ass and well done um i love found footage i'm a sucker for it but i'm just gonna say basically that this movie since we're trying to stay as spoiler free as possible this movie is definitely inspired by certain events known to have taken place at the real life cecil hotel uh i knew none of this going in so if you listen to the show at all you can imagine how excited i was at the various plot line as the various plot lines unfolded um this was basically like my uh, someone made a horror movie for me it was kind of crazy and i can hear all of you rolling your eyes at found footage but this movie works because it turns out found footage still has a few new tricks up its sleeve i don't want to say too much like i said because it's more fun that way though i did have a question for director antoine lee about a certain plot point and how that story played out behind the scenes so you might guess, knowing Cecil Hotel and my crazy obsession, what that might be. Anyway, I tweeted to the director about this, and hopefully you will get an answer directly from him as he is interested in chat, either chatting with us or maybe like answering some questions, you know, that we propose to him. So it's very hard trying not to... Uh, spoil anything but the short version basically is despite any personal interest i have in fictional in the fictional story this is based on i really enjoyed this movie and was pleasantly or i guess gruesomely surprised it's creepy and knows how to build tension that yes often does result in jump scares but they're fucking well earned which is all i ask um i hear there may be a sequel in the works and i'll definitely keep an eye out for that not to mention any of Lee's future projects. Um, if he can creep me the fuck out on a string indie budget, I shudder in the best way possible to think of what he could do with more resources. Uh, do yourselves a favor and check this movie out because surprisingly, like I said, Antoine proves found footage still has a few tricks up its sleeve and its genre will not disappoint. Um, some quick facts. Like I said, the film is based on a few true stories most of which related to the cecil hotel though the story takes place at a different location but is a similar old school like huge ass la hotel essentially so same idea this movie won for best horror feature film at both the burbank international film fest and the sydney indie film fest the latter also securing wins for editing and special effects so there's that um, actor Matthew Solomon, who is the infamous Mike from Drop the Mic, he's the blogger in question, uh, said in an interview with PopHorror.com that, dude, check this out. The cast and crew shot in two different hotels, filming roughly 140 pages in 12 days. That's a lot. I mean, talk about indie. Yeah, fuck. So hopefully we'll get to talk more in depth with director Antoine Lee 
just putting that out into the universe again. But um, because I have so many questions about this movie and, and how it came about. But for now, everybody, I was going to say go out, but I guess go online. Because uh, that's what we're doing now. And support indie filmmaking by streaming this baby and have yourself a nice frightening scare. That's my recommendation for this movie. Cool. I'm not the biggest fan of found footage movies. I know. Um, as, yeah, as you know. Um, but this one is very intriguing because I do like the Cecil and I know what the plot <laughs> of this movie <laughs> is supposed to be about. And I, I think most people could probably figure that out without you even saying it. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to check out this movie because I, I can do found footage if it is done in a new and unique way. Um, so let's move right along to an indie film to another big budget Hollywood horror film, Ugh, Fantasy Island, which <laughs> I've kind of been dreading watching this movie all year, but I had to do it because of this episode. I wanted to do like a fucking wine party, but COVID had to spoil everything and just like get drunk and make fun of this. I think that would be really funny. Honestly, I don't even know if that could have made this movie better, True. but whatever. Good point. It is what it is. Um, so this movie stars Michael Pena from the Ant-Man movies and also Narcos, Maggie Q from Mission Impossible 3 and Divergent, Lucy Hale from Pretty Little Liars and also Scream 4, Jimmy O. Yang, who is in Silicon Valley and Space Force. There's so many fucking people, but shout out to Ryan Hansen from uh, Party Down and, and Veronica Mars. We love him. But there's a fucking lot of people. All right. Um, and then uh, Michael Rooker, who we all know from Walking Dead, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. He's in Brightburn. Mallrats. Mall Is he in Mallrats? Yeah. Oh, God, it's been so long since I've seen Mallrats. Um, but he's very well known for being in Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer as well. Uh, there's also a surprise cameo from Kim Coates. Kim- I don't even know who this Kim is. Kim Coates, yeah. Okay. He's badass. He's from Sons of Anarchy and Prison Break. Okay. So, when the owner and operator of a luxurious island invites a collection of guests to live out their most elaborate fantasies in relative seclusion, chaos quickly descends. Mm-hmm. Uh, little bit of trivia, Jason Blum actually wanted Nicolas Cage to play Mr. Rourke, but Cage passed on the role. That's rough, which- man. If Cage passes, <laughs> like, that's bad. I was going to say Nick Cage is pretty much doing everything. He's up for fucking whatever. Like, yeah, he's in so many movies. So when Nick Cage passes on a role, you know, it's going to be a bad film. All right. So, Mindy, what did you think of this movie? Well, so this is slightly spoilery, but I don't think it counts because it's kind of like, are you fucking serious? No shit. IMDb's trivia section says that this is a reimagining of the show Fantasy Island for the horror genre based on Cabin in the Woods and Westworld. And all I can say to that is no fucking shit. Like, it's not to mention the fact that they're like basically on the fucking Lost Island with Rourke as the island keeper. This is a shout out to Lost fans. I'm not going to bother explaining. But actually, had Hurley and Ben just shown up for the final act along with Maeve, Ed Harris, and Doris from Westworld, that would have at least been an entertaining watch. If you've never watched Lost or Westworld, I apologize that this reference went over your head. But just trust me on this. I do want to point out two honorable mentions. The characters Kyle from Party Down and the character of Yin Yang from Silicon Valley make kind of a fun duo and I did not see that coming but cool um there was one line that got a genuine laugh out of me um it comes late in the movie so again being mindful of spoilers I'll just say that it's the character Brax which aka is like the new tattoos line and Sharon I'm just gonna say it you're probably the only one who's gonna know it's funny but when he says Holy shit, she went out with him one time after like the reveal of the big bad is made. I that made me laugh and I thought it was well played, but I this movie that's like literally I'm grabbing it at strings here. Like there's nothing for this movie. Grabbing at strings or are you grasping at straws? Both. <laughs> Both. All I'm going to say is Nicolas Cage said no to Jason Bloom. Blum. Fuck. <laughs> That's how bad this movie is. It's fucking with me. Don't I don't recommend this at all, Sharon. Um, yeah. 
I didn't think the movie made much sense. I just kept asking why, like one, why did you even like waste money on making a film like this? But also there were so many confusing plot points that I was just like, like why? Like whatever. Um, there was, yeah, a funny tattoo joke. Other than that, complete waste of time. Skip it. Uh, fun fact though, Sid Haig was actually in three episodes of the original Fantasy Island TV show. So, Which I had no idea. That's kind of cool. That's sad that that's like the coolest thing about this movie that we could say. Right? Um, so let's move on from a really bad movie to a really good movie, which is Empedagor. Thank you, Sharon. Um, this stars uh, Tara... Bas- and again, apologize if I mispronounce. Uh, Tara Bas- Basro... Ario Bayou and uh, Marissa Anita, with all due respect to pronunciation, um, the plot of this movie, a city woman survives a brutal attack, but is shocked to discover information about her and her family members from her attacker. She finds out that she has inherited her family's old and dilapidated house in a far off village. In need of money to start off a business, she travels to the village to sell off the house along with her best friend unaware that people in her village have been plagued by a curse and she holds the answer to the curse um this movie was actually based on bad dreams that there and again apologies director uh joko anwar had in 2008 i had pre- previously seen this director's um 2017 movie satan's slave uh, randomly on shutter and i liked the overall look and feel of the film and it had some really good creepy moments and so i went in for this um this movie was similar in terms of the things i liked about it it's very beautiful and creepily beautiful at times to watch i would say um and as we keep saying here at horse talk horror it's so fucking nice to see different kinds of horror stories from different cultures that have their own versions of urban legends based on myths or literal legends or just superstition and also once again we see that horror is universal so good job do yourself a favor and check this out sharon agreed i highly recommend this movie um just from like the very first few seconds of the movie, there was already so much tension created. And that opening scene, man. Dude, oh my God. That was terrifying. I don't think I've ever seen a toll booth scene in a horror movie before. And without giving anything away, I will never drive through a toll booth again without thinking of this scene where, you know, you're a toll booth operator. And you're stuck in this little booth and there's like no exit. There's no escape, really. Like you're isolated and you're by yourself. And but you're also like amongst a bunch of traffic and cars. And it just uh, just, oh, just this whole fucking opening scene, like sucked me into the movie right away. Yeah. Scared the crap out of me. Um, And the film follows some familiar themes that we've seen before in horror movies. But it was a folklore story that took place in a small village and the whole village just seems like completely off. Oh my God. The story was completely original. It was terrifying. And especially as a traveler, just Mm. putting myself into the situation of these characters, like, you know, I will also never travel again when we're ever allowed to uh, (laughs) (laughs) without like thinking about, this movie and it just wonderfully acted beautifully made as you said it was a bit long but Mm -hmm. i was like thoroughly entertained the entire time yeah i just was looking forward to seeing like how the whole thing was gonna turn out um also the ending there was like a great homage to the texas chainsaw massacre (laughs) the original texas chainsaw massacre that i just completely loved um so yeah big thumbs up for this movie definitely check it out Agreed. Agreed. Now, the next movie I have not seen, but Sharon has. She's going to tell us all about Come to Daddy, which I just love to say is a title. (laughs) Um, I actually rewatched this because I watched it at the beginning of the year. And the only things I remembered about this movie was uh, they say the word cunt a lot. (laughs) And there is also something to do with poo pens. Um, Yeah. So I'm really, really glad that I rewatched this movie. Um, But before I get 
to my thoughts on it. It stars Elijah Wood, who's one of my favorites. I love him so much. And also Stephen McCaddy mm-hmm. is in this, who you probably know from Pontypool. Yeah. If you've ever seen that movie, which is also yes. a great and under, like, talked about, I should say. It's not underappreciated. It's such a good fucking movie. Yeah, everyone I know who has seen it loves this movie, but it is just not talked about a lot. Um, he's also in Watchmen. Uh, the story is about Norval, who is a man in his 30s, played by Wood, who travels to a remote cabin to reconnect with his estranged father <laughs> after receiving an unexpected letter from him. Uh, will reconnecting with his father give Norval that emotional fulfillment that he's been lacking all his life? Um Probably not. <laughs> well, it's an isolated cabin, so if I were a betting woman. <laughs> <laughs> and not long after his arrival, he notices that there's something off about his dad, an uneasy feeling triggered by inappropriate comments, uh, hence the word cunt being used a lot, <laughs> um, and a possible overdependence on booze. Norval Sweet. quickly realizes that his hope of a father and son bonding reunion is doomed and instead of a family reunion he finds himself in a waking nightmare um a little bit of trivia about the origin of the film it came to director ant timpson when his father passed away and his father's partner thought it would be best to bring him home after (sighs) embalming as a way for him to spend time with the grieving family ant spent a week with his father's corpse in an open coffin During the day, strangers came to pay their respects, and he started thinking that maybe there was an alternate history to his father. The whole process was cathartic and beautiful and creepy and sad, he said. I came out of it staring death in the face and thinking life's really short. I should get back to what really means something to me, which, apart from my poor dead dad, was getting back into making films. Huh. Okay. So. That's lovely. Yeah, I agree. That is kind of lovely. And as I said, I'm really glad that I rewatched this film because I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, The first time I watched it, I obviously was not paying much attention at all because Mm. I didn't really care for it. But I also realized that, um, yeah, I forgot so much of it. I was probably like on my phone the entire time (laughs) doing other stuff. Um, But from the very beginning of this movie, things are just completely off especially elijah wood's mustache (laughs) he's he's got this creepy like pedophile mustache and this weird like serial killer bowl cut um but besides that his dad's just like a totally unhinged asshole psychopath and when things go bad they just go from like bad to worse really really quickly um and then they just keep getting worse and worse and worse there's really good gore uh Mm. the movie is not overly violent but there's some really good fight scenes including one scene that just looked like (laughs) it was probably so much fun for elijah wood to film and like it just seemed like it would be like a really cathartic scene for an actor to film um if you've seen this movie i'm sure you know what i'm talking about but there's also a little bit of like heart and emotion mixed in the dialogue is very colorful it's um kind of strange and also really funny but i'm so glad i gave this a second chance because i really really liked it huh okay okay so speaking of films that needed a second chance one that i had to rewatch um what is scare package which is available on shutter starring uh jeremy king noah segan from uh knives out and looper and a cameo from joe bob briggs Um, The plot, Chad is a horror aficionado and he's lonely. Chad spends his days at his struggling genre video store arguing with his only regular customer, Sam. When an unsuspecting job applicant shows up, Chad begins to teach him about the rules of horror and his video store at large. During Chad's onboarding process, we weave in and out of different horror stories each one geared at a different set of horror tropes. As this new applicant learns the ropes, haha, uh, he begins to suspect Chad of something sinister, but we quickly learned that he may have a secret of his own. I'm glad I, re- I'm definitely glad I rewatched this. I really like this a lot. On a second watch, there's some trivia. There's so many fucking nods to popular horror films. 
there's a jock character dressed like Johnny Depp's character in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh my God. Chad drives a convertible, a red convertible, and the top is red and green stripes like Freddy Krueger's iconic sweater and the ending of Nightmare on Elm Street, the original fan i want a car like that so bad (laughs) um the map shown in the last segment has multiple horror nods that include the cenobite cafe from hellraiser uh last records room on the left which is so cute like last house on the left uh server room 237 like the shining (laughs) uh outpost 31 like the thing and v slash h slash s archives obviously like the vhs films Delta 88, Evil Dead, the neon R- Brad Chad's Horror Emporium sign is a near direct replica of the last drive in with Joe Bob Briggs sign. Like, it's amazing. Like, you go on. I stopped trying to count how many references were in this movie just because it was so much fun to watch. Yeah, I thought this was a really good anthology movie. Um, it did not disappoint. It's very bloody, it's a good low budget gore horror, gore horror film um it's funny and as you mentioned all the references it's very meta um there was a great reference to Corey feldman's character from friday the 13th that i thought was kind of hilarious and there was also some segments that were not super great but you know mm-hmm. you expect that with any anthology film like there's always like some short stories that are just like okay but then like there's other ones that you know were really good but overall as a whole i just thought this movie was really enjoyable and it's a great watch for any horror fan who likes to find easter eggs yeah and there's plenty to quickly comment on the Corey feldman reference my fourth or fifth grade like inner self was doing cartwheels over what starts as just this like casual reference and turns into like a Corey's who's on first bit And I'm sorry, quick spoiler, but I'm going to quote it because it's so fucking funny. These two characters are talking about a situation and one's like talking about what horror movies he's seen. He's like, I just remember Friday the 13th with Corey Feldman and the other's like the Lost Boys dude. No, that's Corey Haim. Pretty sure that's License to Drive. Another reason it's funny, pretty sure Sheridan and I saw License to Drive in fucking theaters, didn't we? Or we we at least (laughs) rented it. For sure. It's very possible. Uh, we were sort of Corey girls back in the day, and Al- Sharon's still kind of a Corey Feldman girl now, but like mm. that, I laughed my <laughs> fucking ass off during that scene. It was awesome. Um, I, do, it, I still do like Corey Feldman, but not in the same way that I liked him when <laughs> I was like an eight or nine year old. Let's just clarify that. He right. just, he has a special place in my heart sure. because he was in so many of my favorite movies growing up. But sure. Anyways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, Joe Bob Briggs is involved in this movie and he riffed on one of my favorite lines from a movie ever by saying, if you people want to live, come with me, which was a play on Kyle Reese's infamous first words to Sarah Connor in the original Terminator, come with me if you want to live, which is like one of my favorite lines. So it had my heart at that line. Yeah, this was definitely fun. Thank you, Sharon, for talking it up so much that I rewatched it. Uh, Another fun movie, After Midnight, which we've uh, mentioned on our show previously at the beginning of the year. It stars Jeremy Gardner, Christian Stella, and Henry Zabrowski from last podcast on the left. When his girlfriend suddenly disappears, leaving a cryptic note as her only explanation, Hank's comfortable life and his sanity begin to crack. Then from the woods surrounding his house, something terrible starts to break in. Uh, Yeah, I really enjoyed this film. I thought the acting was really solid. It was very well produced for an independent film. Also, I will never listen to the song Stay by Lisa Loeb ever again without thinking of this movie. Agreed. Um, This was a fun one that's going to have to go on my rewatch list for sure. Uh, it had some surprises and agreed that it was well produced for Andy film. As for Lisa Loeb, the song was already memorable to me after a friend used it in one of my favorite, most hilarious theater bits uh, in a performance a few years ago. But its use in After Midnight is equally memorable for me and definitely unforgettable. 
for those who already don't have an association with that song, fucking amazing. And if all this talk about stay is making you go, well, what the hell happens? What's the deal with the song? Do yourself a favor and check this one out. Trust us. Also, you're welcome. Sharon, what's next? All right. So after talking about a couple of fun horror movies, uh, the next movie is definitely not a fun horror movie. (laughs) Um, In fact, this movie gave me like super bad anxiety um but it that's not a bad thing it's just a very effective film uh we're gonna be talking about alone which stars jules wilcox who is in dirty john the betty broderick story and mark menchaca i hope i said that right he is in uh the sinner and also homeland and ozark it is about a recently widowed female traveler who is kidnapped by a cold-blooded killer only to escape into the wilderness where she is forced to battle against the elements as her pursuer closes in on her. Yeah, I was like, hard pass. I can't. I loved this movie, though. It was, I mean, it's basically my worst nightmare being <laughs> uh, kidnapped by a, a serial killer and held hostage and having to escape. And then, yeah, it, this entire movie was just like, I was, blah, I'll get to that in a second. Um. A little bit of trivia, though. Actress Jules Wilcox actually broke her foot while shooting one of the first action scenes in the movie, and she decided to finish the shoot in a boot and with the help of her stunt double. Um, So some of the scenes had to be finished a few months later when she was fully healed, but she went, like, all into this. So my first thoughts after watching this movie were this is why every woman needs to watch forensic files <laughs> and also every other real life true crime show that is out there. I mean, this movie basically showcases what it's like to be a woman and have to be hyper vigilant 24 seven and always on guard and being cognizant of your surroundings and also trusting your gut. And to quote my favorite murder to fuck politeness because honestly there is like certain points in this film when I was like oh my god okay why are you still being nice to this person like this is like the creepiest fucking dude ever trust your (laughs) gut just fucking get the fuck out of there stop talking to this guy um and if you've ever done like a solo road trip or whatever you oh I mean maybe don't watch this movie because it is so realistic. But also, if you are planning to do a road trip in the future, you may want to watch this because it may save your life. Um, Yeah, since we can't really fly so much these days, that's all you can really do is do a road trip. But holy fucking shit, there was just so much heightened tension throughout the entire film, especially in the beginning. Like, Spencer and I watched this together and there was a couple times where I'm like, I just need to pause this and take a breather because it it just seemed like so real. And I was just putting myself in that situation and being like, all right, I need to calm down. <laughs> this is just a movie. Um, but the main actress was amazing and you just like rooted for her the entire time. I love the ending of this movie. The ending of the movie was fucking great. Um, yeah, I was just in it from like the very start to the end. It did not disappoint. I totally recommend you watching this movie. I know you're like hard pass, but honestly, it's so good and so well done. You just have to watch it when you're in the mood for it. And like, honestly, the thing is, without giving it much away, nothing really that horrible happens. It's just the idea behind it. And like, I mean, she's a fucking fighter and it it could have been a lot fucking worse. Smart, smart female characters. This movie had one. OK, Sharon, would you say that it wasn't so much what happens in the movie, but it was more of the implication? All right. We need to put that Dennis quote to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, uh, we're going to talk about Murder in the Woods again because it's that good. Um, it stars uh, again, again. Apologies for mispronunciations. Uh, Jose Julian, uh, Jeanette Simano, uh, Chelsea Rendon, and a special guest appearance by Danny Trejo. The basic plot, soon after arriving at a mysterious cabin in the woods, a group of teens discover the dark secret it holds, which forces them to fight for their lives. 
Personally, I cannot recommend this movie enough. I also highly recommend checking out our interview in episode 63 with the film's writer, Yelena de Leon, and director Luis Ica Garza. This is a fresh take on the, quote, teens partying at a cabin in the woods trope. And this movie definitely proves that good horror is good horror, full stop. End of story. Very good. Please do yourself a favor and watch it. I agree. Uh, fun take on a sleep. On a Sleen slasher movie. It's a. <laughs> I agree. It's a fun take on a teen slasher movie. I liked all the characters. It was well acted. Um, plus, there's a few good surprises along the way. And once again, how many times do we have to say it, people? It's great to see mm. more diversity in horror. And this movie had, I think, an entirely mm-hmm. Latinx cast and crew. Um, at yeah. least the cast. Um, I, as far as the crew, I would say a mostly uh, Latinx crew. But yeah, check it out. Yeah, good stuff. Um, speaking of diversity and horror, let's talk about Evil Eye, which is actually one of the uh, Blumhouse movies that are that is featured on Amazon Prime right now, as in December 2020, if you're listening to this. This was directed by, and again, uh, apologies in, ab- in advance for mispronunciations, but uh, directed by Elon Dasani and Rajiv Dasani, um, written by Madhiri Shekhar, based on the Audible original, original also written by the same person. Uh, the plot of Superstitious Mother is convinced that her daughter's new boyfriend is the reincarnation of a man who tried to kill her over 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that this was like too scary in terms of like it kept me up. I couldn't sleep that night scary, but it was again (laughs) really good and awesome to see other cultures and colors featured in a horror flick. Um, This movie's another that benefits from not knowing too much going in plot wise. Uh, The entire cast was just utterly fantastic. And I'll say this. If you're going to have a twist in a movie, it better be fucking worth it. And this one, like I said, didn't keep me up at night after viewing. But I'm still thinking about the fact that I did not see or I guess want to see the end game in this movie. And by the time you get to the end, your skin will be sufficiently crawling. So, I mean, mine was. So just watch it. Basically, it's on Hulu. Do or It was on Amazon Prime. Do yourself a favor. It's good. Yeah. No, this sounds really interesting um i have the plot sounds kind of fascinating so i will have to check this out um a a movie that i've had stuck in my head since i watched it and also cannot recommend enough is swallow starring Haley bennett who is in the magnificent seven and the girl on the train and austin stowell who is in (laughs) fantasy island i mean (laughs) every every role you pick can't be a winning role um you gotta pay the bills i mean shit for real um he's also in whiplash it's about a woman named hunter who is a newly pregnant housewife and she finds herself increasingly compelled to consume dangerous objects. As her husband and his family tighten their control over her life, she must confront the dark secret behind her new obsession. A little bit of trivia about this movie. Director Carlo Mirabella Davis said that the film was inspired by his grandmother, who was a homemaker in the 1940s and 50s. She was in an unhappy marriage and developed various rituals of control. She was an obsessive hand washer who would go through 12 bottles of rubbing alcohol a week and oh my four God. bars of soap a day. I mean, I'm an obsessive hand washer, but that is like, wow, that's next level. Totally. And also washing your hands with rubbing alcohol. Oh, my like, God. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I can't imagine how dry her hands were. Um. Anyways, he thinks she was looking for order in a life she felt increasingly powerless in. At the behest of the doctors, his grandfather put her into a mental institution where she was given electroshock therapy, insulin shock therapy, and a non-consensual lobotomy. And she ended up losing her sense of taste and smell. That's just very fucking tragic. That's so sad. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously, we still don't know how to treat mental health issues in this country, but... Put God a pin damn, on that. I'm Put a pin in really that. Gl- we'll get to that later. But I'm really glad that um, 
things have changed a little bit for the better, I guess. Um, well, yeah. I mean, you don't get sent off to an institution with electro shock therapy like quite as easily. <laughs> For I mean, sure. I hope yeah, not. That's not, horrifying. Not that we hear about anymore. Anyways, um, he also said, I remember seeing a photograph of all the contents that had been removed from the stomach of a patient with pica. Oh, yeah. I shit. was fascinated and I wanted to know what drew the patient to those artifacts. It almost felt like a mystical experience. I wanted to know more. And that's how it began. Wow. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, where the concept for this movie came from. I just loved this movie so much. It's set in the present day, but the main character, Hunter, played brilliantly by Haley Bennett, is like, a, you know, the soft-spoken 1950s housewife. Um, her husband and his parents are, like, the worst. I'm so glad. Like, after watching this movie, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so thankful for, like, my in-laws. Like, they are nothing like this. Like, my in-laws are fucking awesome. Um you just feel so sorry for her right away. Like her husband doesn't hear her. Her in-laws don't hear her. I mean, they treat her as like this pretty little um, object, basically, who is just supposed to be a housewife and give them grandchildren and children. You know, it's 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 really sad. Um, and you can kind of see why her character does what her character does and all they care about is just money and business, and she's basically trapped in a suburban housewife hell. And then on top of that, she finds out that she's pregnant. Uh, so she starts eating strange objects as a way to reclaim her sense of autonomy over her own body. Um, and honestly, I related to this movie like so much. Um, I've never had pica, but I did have an eating disorder at one time, and it like totally took over my life. And I totally empathized with this character um and just i understand what it's like to to have an ups like a compulsive disorder like this to try and get like some sort of control in your life the movie also continuously built up tension about what was going to happen next you know especially since she was eating objects that were becoming increasingly dangerous and she was pregnant um so you you didn't really know what was going to happen there's also a few comical scenes that kind of break up some of the tension of the movie stylistically like the colors the set design of this film absolutely fucking gorgeous lots of bold colors um great use of composition within a scene that make the viewer feel an emotional connection to hunter um, yeah, I fucking loved, loved, loved the ending of this movie so much. It was what I was hoping the character would do. And she fucking did it. And yeah, I just, this movie has, it, I related to it on so many different levels. And it just has stuck with me since then. I cannot recommend this movie enough. Okay. I did look at what it was about. It was kind of like, I just, right now I'm at a period where I have to be kind of careful. Just because like work's really busy and the world is kind of crazy, and I, I was like, I just don't think I can do this right now, but it does look very interesting. Um, Honestly, I think it it might be a little difficult to watch, but I think the ending for it will be mm. extremely cathartic for you, and it the ending is, I will say it ends on a, um, a pretty uplifting note. Well, I guess depending on your um, views <laughs> of the subject matter. I, I was elated by the ending. Okay. Okay, so um, moving on to a, we'll say, horse talk horror favorite around here. Um, the movie The Hunt, which stars Betty Gilpin from Glow, Nurse Jackie, the aforementioned The Grudge 2020, and all-around badass awesome woman, and Hilary Swank. And that is just to name a few, because the cast is, like, stupid ridiculous in this movie. It's amazing. Uh, the basic plot, 12 strangers wake up in a clearing. They don't know where they are or how they got there. In the shadow of a dark internet conspiracy theory, ruthless elitists gather at a remote location to hunt humans for sport. But their master plan is about to be derailed when one of the hunted, Crystal, turns the tables on her pursuers. Um, trivia, the final fight scene was choreographed by five women. Fuck yes. Uh, Heidi Moneymaker, haha, good name, was the lead. 
uh, with input from actresses Betty Gilpin and Hilary Swank and their respective stunt doubles. And I think it totally shows. Um, and I have to give a shout out to some of the character names listed in the movie, which are as follows. Shut the fuck up, Gary. Yoga pants. Target. Dead sexy. Vanilla. Nice. Big Red. Staten Island. And randy four n's and four e's we talked about this movie i love it so good randy all right yeah absolutely love this movie um i mean we've never done an entire episode where we just talk about one movie before except for this movie so that tells you something uh if you want to hear a much deeper dive into this movie go check out our episode number 48 um yeah we talk about everything there so we're not gonna really reiterate all of our thoughts on this film because we can go on forever um the one thing i will say is that this movie did a really good job of showing the extremes on both sides making both the right and left look ridiculous betty gilbin's character is what makes this movie for me i mean she's an amazing badass which i already kind of knew she was just from watching her in glow um but yeah having one character be the sense of reason between the two extreme sides is just what really showcases the absurdity of this film and lets you know that it's a total satire. Highly, highly recommend. And I'm kind of uh, jealous that you watched it again already, Minnie, because I think I just need to buy it and watch it again really, really soon. I stand by my original thoughts on this movie um, basically what Sharon said, <laughs> especially about Betty Gilpin. And if I couldn't love her more, like I said, the rest of the cast is just balls. It's absurd. It's just total absurd fun. And I still love it. And I enjoyed watching it again and say, fuck the haters. Let's go from one of our favorites to a movie that you wisely did not see, Mindy. Yeah, um, hard pass. We're going to talk about The Turning. Stars Mackenzie Davis from Blade Runner 2049 and Black Mirror, Finn Wolfhard from Stranger Things, and Brooklyn Prince from The Florida Project, a movie that I still need to see. Um, Yeah, same. But, I mean, this is something that's been done before and much better um, than this film. (laughs) A young governess is hired to look after an orphaned girl But the return of the girl's problematic brother uncovers secrets from their past. It's a modern take on the Henry James novella, The Turn of the Screw, and was also a 1960s film, The Innocents. And my favorite version of it is Mm -hmm. the Mike Flanagan haunting a blind manor. But a little bit of trivia, Jolie Richardson, who plays Darla Mandel, is the fourth member of her family to appear in an adaptation of the 1898 horror novella The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. So her grandfather, Michael Redgrave, played the uncle in The Innocents from 1961. Her aunt, Lynn Redgrave, played the governess, Miss Jane Coverley, in The Turn of the Screw from 1974. And her uncle, Corin Redgrave, played the professor in The Turn of the Screw in 2009. Um, This is the second movie of 2020 to receive an F cinema score. (laughs) The first movie being The Grudge. What Uh, up? (laughs) Out of all the movies that we are talking about in uh, these last two episodes, this movie, I think, is the lowest scored. It only has a 3.8 on IMDb. And The Grudge, slightly higher than that, at a 4.3. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I will say it earned every <laughs> every one of those three that, point eight. <laughs> yes, it it earned that score completely. Um, I read about the ending to this movie by accident, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm out." No, absolutely not. So, thank you for sitting through this. Uh yeah, you're welcome. Um, so the main young boy, Miles. In the film, he's even way more of a dick than in The Innocence or even in The Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, And it's not subtle at all, which (laughs) it's kind of supposed to be a little subtle. Yeah. The subtlety is what makes The Innocence and Bly Manor creepy and gives those movies a bit of tension. 
In this movie, Miles is just terrifying and once again, sent off to juvie. <laughs> uh, don't know why anyone put up with his shit. Um, but yeah, this movie had none of the detail that was in the novella. So much of the story was just like completely stripped away. So why even bother making it? Honestly, I have no idea. Um, and watching this after watching Bly Manor definitely made this movie even worse. I mean, just skip this movie completely. Watch The Innocence or better yet, watch Bly Manor. That's my thoughts on that. Sweet. I intend to watch Bly Manor. Bly Manor, I haven't yet, but I just haven't had time. So, yeah, I I heard thought as much. So another movie that maybe had some promise but didn't necessarily follow through, The Lodge. Um, this was written and directed by Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz, who also wrote and directed Goodnight Mommy, which I fucking love. Stars Riley Keough. Uh, Fury Road, The House That Jack Built, and uh, Elvis's Granddaughter. Uh, Jaden Martell from the new It movies. The basic plot, a soon-to-be stepmom, is snowed in with her fiancé's two children at a remote holiday village. Remote, again, bad idea, always. Just as relations begin to thaw between the trio, some strange and frightening events take place. Um, we did talk about this in a previous episode, Um a little bit of trivia, the cult mentioned in this movie is clearly based on Heaven's Gate. If you're not familiar with that cult, it has a tragic ending in which 39 members of Heaven's Gate committed mass suicide. Yeah, so since we talked about this before, we're not going to go into it um, too much, but it's a slow psychological horror film that questions whether what you're watching is real versus imaginary, um, or is it a mental illness, or could it be related to paranormal activity? I do want to read a quote from one of the writers of the film, Veronica Franz, which comes from Cinema Blend. Quote, we wanted to show people being both good and bad, guilty and not guilty. And I think it's the combination of all of it, the lack of communication that creates the tragedy or the horror. We like that you always see the shades of gray. You should not know from the first scene who you should like and not like because of the character being the good guy or not. We want you to like everyone and also at certain moments dislike them, which I think is a great summary of how you feel about all the characters in this film and basically how I felt the entire time watching it and trying to figure out what is going on. Yeah, agreed. Um, I did like the film you know just on the little bit that i read about it before seeing it i thought it was going to be more fucked up and disturbing uh more like on the lines of ari aster um i definitely think goodnight mommy <laughs> is probably way more fucked up than this film um but it was still good i would recommend it yeah i love these filmmakers and i really loved goodnight mommy which was their debut film. Um, in that film, vagueness story-wise, I think worked due to the film's perspective, aka that of like the children's. It worked to a degree. With The Lodge, there were some decisions that needed more justification or explanation, in my opinion, because some of them were just so, what the fuck, it was like plain distracting for me. Like one of which essentially sets the entire plot in motion and made me say, wait, literally, what the fuck? So much that I got pulled out of the film because I feel like no responsible human would do or would make this decision. Sometimes things are better left unsaid, sure, but too much can be detrimental to the film. So it, I think they still have to find that balance, but as always, their visuals, mood, tension, all were fucking great and... Though the visual similarities to Hereditary were kind of odd for me because they didn't rip it off, but like it was very visually close to Hereditary. That's all I'm going to say. Apparently, creepy dollhouses were big for horror directors the past few years. I don't know. But yeah, I overall, I did like this movie and I would recommend it. All right. So next up, we have a movie that Mindy actually recommended to me, uh, Scare Me which stars Josh Rubin, Aya Cash, who is in The Boys, and Chris Redd, who is from Saturday Night Live. 
It's uh, about two strangers who meet during a power outage and tell scary stories. The more Fred and Fanny, that's the name of the two characters, commit to their tales, the more the stories come to life in their Catskills cabin. The horrors of reality manifest when Fred confronts his ultimate fear. Um, so I think Mindy liked this movie a little bit more than I did. <laughs> I think the premise of it is really good and it's original at least. Um, I also appreciated some of the mentions of some of my favorite horror movies growing up, Poltergeist, Silver Bullet, and Halloween. Also, I liked that the female character in the movie was um, not only a better writer at horror movies than the um, the male character, but she could also build a fire and the main character or the, the main male character could not. Um, and it did have a good ending. I did think it was, you know, kind of slow and boring in some parts. Um, I don't know. I think I just expected a little more out of it, but I will give it a thumbs up for originality. Nice. Um, yeah, I figured you'd like the Silver Bullet, Poltergeist, and Halloween references. Um, I recommended this one at Halloween, and I stand by it. I also appreciate not only how... How do you say her name? Aya Cash? I think Aya Cash's character is written, but the strong performance that like bolsters that writing like I think she's awesome in this um I do feel like it goes off the rails slightly midway through but I do also feel like they manage to like rein it back in and they do deliver a very satisfying ending so yeah I I still stand by this recommendation another one that's a little more controversial and one of my favorites for this year is uh our next movie she dies tomorrow written and directed by uh Amy Simitz Starring Katie Lynn Scheel, Jane Addams, who's a fucking amazing character actress who you might have seen in Twin Peaks, The Return. She's awesome. And uh, Ken Tucker, oddly, apologize if I said that wrong. Basic general plot. Amy thinks she's dying tomorrow and it's contagious. Uh, <laughs> anything you need to know, really, uh, Katie Lynn Scheel and Jane Addams are actually good friends with the director in real life. Um, she said in an interview uh, that she when she freaks out over anxiety. They're the ones she calls generally. Also, in the film, the character Amy lives in a house that is actually the director Amy's real home. So that's kind of fun. Clearly, I love this, but it's not for everyone. And it's definitely not a traditional horror movie. This ain't your mama's scary movie. Or your mama's mama. I don't know. I was trying for a joke. I don't know. She dies tomorrow. I know how pretentious this is going to fucking sound. But it is a film that needs to be experienced, even if only on an aesthetic level, as opposed to watched. If you don't feel the emotional impact, your senses are still bombarded with the light and sound. Director Simons manages to somehow recreate on film what it feels like in my fucking brain when I'm having a severe anxiety attack, which happens kind of on the regular. Um, so this movie feels just extra personal to me, but it's also very abstract. It's a movie that I personally just find terrifying, not just because we're like currently literally in the middle of a pandemic with a highly contagious disease, which is the basic premise of this, but also because uncontrolled anxiety can wreak havoc on the body and brain. And on top of making you feel shitty, it often leaves no physical or visual cues that it exists. So like if that shit is catchy, could you even imagine being anxious about catching more anxiety? Fuck this. I'm about to have a panic attack just thinking about this. Um, breather. On a, tech on a technical level, this movie I think is gorgeous to watch. There were a lot of elements that actually felt very Lynchian to me. Um, all that said, if you're looking for some good serial killing or to take your mind off a rough day at work or a good exorcism as a nightcap, this might not be the horror movie you're looking for, which is fine because not everyone is going to like everything, but I do love this. Fun, weird fact, uh, this the Lacrimosa music we hear throughout the film is from Mozart's Requiem Mass. Um, it means or translates to weeping and tearful in Latin and describes the main character's mood. And oddly, I had just like randomly downloaded the piano music for this very piece two days before I watched this for the first time, not even knowing that this was involved. So that was just weird. But to be fair, the song works better with a choir, not just a piano. 
Side note. Synchronicity. And Sharon, I know, I know this is probably not what you were <laughs> expecting. And I feel weird calling it a horror movie. It plays to my yeah. fears, but it's just not a typical. I don't even think this movie should be on our <laughs> list. Um, I watched it because the premise of the movie sounded really interesting and promising. And I really, really wanted to like it because you spoke so highly of it. But honestly, if you didn't explain the storyline of the film, it would have gone like completely over my head. And honestly, even after knowing what it was about, it still went completely over my head. I didn't feel like tension or anxiety or like I I couldn't relate to it on like any level. And I have anxiety Mm -hmm. um, and I get it pretty bad. I just there is nothing about this movie that made me think of an anxiety attack. And I know everyone's anxiety attacks are different. Everyone experiences that differently. But I just thought this movie was like extremely slow and boring. I almost fell asleep during it multiple times. I was like, no, I just got to get through it. Um, I think it lacked character development. I kept waiting for something interesting to happen, but like there was no suspense or tension. There was no twist. I didn't think there was any payoff. And like, I would just kind of felt pissed off when it was over that I (laughs) wasted Almost an hour and a half of my time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I I will... Well, I 100% respect your opinion, obviously. And um, like I said, this isn't for everybody. I would argue that it does have payoff at the end, but we're not going to talk about anything like that because spoilers. Uh, we could talk offline, but I do see how people going in... Because, like, honestly, I put it on this list because like the industry quote unquote rated it as a horror film which i kind of don't again i don't this is not a traditional scary movie i can totally see how somebody going in for like good like jump scares or ghosts or whatever the fuck is like what is this artsy crap like i get that 100 percent um we'll talk about the payoff offline but um yeah, I only really put this on the list because it is considered a horror movie and I love it. So we'll now move on to a movie that I haven't seen but very much want to watch. Yeah, so this is a movie that I actually really, really liked. Um, <laughs> uh, this movie is His House, which stars Chopin Dirasu, who is on the sci-fi TV show Humans. He's also been in Black Mirror. And it also stars... Wunmi Musaku, who is in Lovecraft Country, which I still need to watch. Um, as she's also in Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. And Matt Smith, who is in Doctor Who and The Crown, is also in this film. I'm sorry, he's not in Doctor Who. He is the fucking Doctor. Whatever. <clears throat> I still haven't seen any it's episode ever of Doctor Who. <laughs> he's great. I love Matt Smith, to be honest. But anyway. Um, So it's about a refugee couple that makes a harrowing escape from war-torn South Sudan. But then they struggle to adjust their new life in an English town that has an evil lurking beneath the surface. A little bit of trivia here. Um, This comes from an interview for Collider. Director and one of the writers of his house, Remy Weeks, said, quote, We did so much research before writing the script, and one of the things that I found really rich was in the asylum process in this country, the government would often give someone a house to live in, but by getting a house, you have to follow these really draconian rules. For example, you're not allowed to leave the house. You're not allowed to have a job. You're given a very small amount of money weekly to live on, and this seems such a cruel and cold way to treat people who are trying to come to terms in a new home and moving forward to their new life. And I felt like, especially in the horror genre, in the haunted house genre, this seemed a particularly rich scenario to be in when you're forced into a house that could be haunted, but you're not able to get out. Wow. So that's amazing inspiration and it's very obvious in this film that they did do a lot of research this film was just so well done i loved this movie it's legitimately scary on multiple levels i'm just gonna say that um there's terrifying imagery that i felt was completely fresh things that i've not seen in other movies before and the entire movie was just fresh like i've not seen a movie quite like this before i mean We've seen a million haunted house movies, but not done in this way. And on top of, you know, the fact that you're watching 
a film that deals with a haunted house and there's like entities or spirits or whatever, I felt completely nervous for the family throughout the entire movie because they could have made this movie solely about racism and hostility that immigrants face when they move to a new country and they're trying to assimilate. Um, And there was definitely some of that, but that story took a backseat to the supernatural horrors that this couple faced in their new home. So it was more of a horror movie that just centered around a couple who happened to be immigrants from Sudan instead of making the whole movie about the prejudice and racism that immigrants face, which is very refreshing. Once again, it's like, you know, not using uh, stereotypes so much. You're using characters that are diverse, but you're you're not portraying them in a stereotypical way, which I appreciate. Uh, but because human monsters are the worst, I was just like terrified the entire time that there was going to be a bunch of asshole people, uh, asshole like white people, <laughs> who um, were just going to like destroy these poor people's lives who are only traveling to a new country to look for a safer place to live and have better opportunities. Um, But yeah, I'm glad that that kind of like took a backseat to the real horrors that they were experiencing in this house. And the production value of this film was amazing. Just like the set design was just so creepy. The house that they were living in was just so dilapidated. And um, it, it was just very well done. All of it was just so well done. The acting was amazing. Um, yeah, wonderful original horror movie. Highly recommend. Awesome. Sold. Now let's talk about a so-so one, maybe. Um, the Beach House, uh, starring Liana Liberato, Noah Lagrasse, Jake Weber, Marianne Nagel. The basic plot, a romantic getaway for two troubled college sweethearts turns into a struggle for survival when unexpected guests and the surrounding environment exhibit signs of a mysterious infection. Um, This was another one that got released oddly, like right around lockdown time. So a lot of folks were comparing this to COVID. Some fun trivia. The film was shot at the producer Andy uh, Corkin's father's North Truro residence in Cape Cod during the off season, which is so fucking fancy. Oh my God. Wow. (laughs) Anyway, I liked this movie, but again, I went in cold, so I didn't hear folks comparing it to the pandemic as COVID, like I said, really started to hit around the time I watched this. It's a quiet, interesting movie that I didn't quite find so scary so much as intriguing and very lovely to watch. And I think I dug it. So... There you go. Yeah, I've been I've been on the fence about whether or not I want to actually watch this. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know. I might pass on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I get it. I get it. All right. Another movie, which I'm kind of on the fence about whether I like it or not, um, is The Dark and the Wicked. It stars Marin Ireland, Michael Abbott Jr., and Xander Berkeley. It's about a secluded farm in a nondescript rural town where a man is slowly dying. His family gathers to mourn, and soon the darkness grows, marked by waking nightmares and a growing sense that something evil is taking over the family. It's directed by Brian Bertino, um, and he did The Strangers, which I thought that movie was absolutely terrifying. Um, And I I really enjoy that movie, even though on a recent rewatch, I decided how stupid every character is. Thank you. That's all I ask. That's all I Um, ask. I still really like that movie, though. And I I like the sequel, even though um, that's a pretty unpopular opinion. Um, (laughs) But a little bit of trivia. The film was actually filmed at director Brian Bertino's Family Farm, which... uh, Kind of cool that he has such a creepy farm. Right? Um, Clearly, Hereditary was like one of, if not the most influential horror film in the past, what, like five or so years? I feel like so many films since have echoes of this movie thematically, visually, stylistically, etc. This movie is a perfect example of that. Um, I also felt like I saw winks to Mike Flanagan and there's 100% a Twin Peaks mirror visual in one scene 
but I do, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So there you go. Um, the movie is all atmosphere created entirely with audio visuals and strong performances and not really so much about plot detail or defined answers. I thought it started out promising, but if a more straightforward plot slash storyline is your thing, not really sure how this would play. Um, to this quote from uh, Frank Shrek's, apologies if I mispronounced, uh, from The Hollywood Reporter, kind of sums this up for me. Quote, writer-director Bertino never lets the simmering tension dissipate. The ambient sound design, uh, disturbing musical score, dis orienting visuals and subtle special effects add immeasurably to the overall impact but it's a lead actress marin ireland's shattering performance that truly gives the film its gripping power ireland conveys a fascinating mixture of fragile vulnerability and steely toughness that fully draws us into her character's encroaching terror and lingering guilt and all i'm gonna say is i'm an only child and while i don't feel this way about my parents or show this kind of emotion about my relationship with my parents I think that helped me relate so Sharon yeah I I like the film I didn't love it I think I actually need a rewatch of it um definitely remind me of hereditary in many ways which also I'm kind of getting sick of that like uh, right hereditary is such a great movie everyone needs to like stop ripping it off and copying it and doing their own original shit. Um, totally beautifully shot. And yeah, the atmosphere is what made the movie so dark and creepy. Um, like I said, The Strangers is much scarier because honestly, human monsters are usually always scarier to me than yeah. something you can't see, which this movie deals with something, you know, on a supernatural level yeah it's um, more abstract for sure definitely um in terms of like the bad guy type situation exactly um so yeah i think i'm gonna have to watch this again and just kind of be more objective about it i i, I don't know what i was expecting the first time around but i don't think i i fully took everything in so fair enough that, that's that's all i'm gonna say about that cool a, a similar kind of movie um, is Color Out of Space, which I actually did another rewatch on this. Also, I think this is a movie you kind of have to watch twice. I'm really glad that I rewatched it. It stars Nicolas Cage, Jolie Richardson, and Madeline Arthur. It's produced by SpectreVision, which is the uh, production company that was founded by Elijah Wood and Daniel Noah and Josh C. Waller. And they're the ones that also did, um, produced Mandy, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and Daniel Isn't Real. It's based on the short story, The Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. And this also takes place on a secluded farm, <laughs> like <laughs> like The Dark and the Wicked. I um, mean, if you're going to get scary, just go secluded, right? I'm going to say I liked this movie way more than I liked The Dark and the Wicked, mm. and it did not have to rely on just like totally, you know, ripping off the uh, atmosphere from <laughs> Hereditary, um, which is one of the reasons why I liked it more. Um, but as I said, it's based on the H.P. Lovecraft short story about a secluded farm that is struck by a strange meteorite, which has apocalyptic consequences for the family living there and possibly the world. A little bit of trivia. Nicolas Cage always wanted to make a Lovecraft adaptation as a tribute to his father, August Coppola, who is Francis Ford Coppola's older brother, which I don't know if I realized that they were related. Oh, I'm yeah. sure I've heard it, but it was not like something at the forefront of uh, my brain. Um, so when I read that, I was like, huh, OK, that's very sweet. Um, yeah. N Cage is a Coppola for sure, but that's very sweet. Yeah, his father apparently was a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, also, director Richard Stanley's favorite movie of Nicolas Cage is Vampire's Kiss. Really? Which is going on my list. Uh, it's one of the few Cage movies. I sh shouldn't even say few because he he's been in so many goddamn movies. Like, I can't even keep track. Um, but as far as, like, more popular ones, this is one that I have not seen. Um, and he asked Cage to use the same style of performance <laughs> in this film. I'm sorry, but I love Nicolas Cage. Let's just say it. Like, he's an American treasure, kind of. 
in like the worst way, best way possible. <laughs> I absolutely adore him as well. Um, I will have to say, though, that my favorite performance of his is from Wild at Heart, hands you know, down. I'm torn between movie. Moonstruck and um, uh, Raising, Raising Arizona. Arizona. But Moonstruck, I watched as a kid. I thought that's the only, quote, romantic comedy I actually like. So good. Anyway, what happens in this movie? Because I haven't watched it because I feel intimidated by it, quite frankly. I'm not a Lovecraft person. A friend of mine who is was like, you need to read Lovecraft. And so I tell me about it. All right. So like I said, I really needed to take it all in. So I'm so glad I did a second watch. And it's basically the stereotypical American dream turning into a total nightmare overnight. Um, of course, it takes place on a secluded farm in the woods, <laughs> which is the perfect setting for any horror movie. Um, but seriously, where they shot this film is just... I. I loved it. Like this would be where I would pick to retire if I could <laughs> live anywhere. It's it's just so fucking beautiful and it was um it's in the woods, but it's also like right next to a, a lake or I'm guessing it's a lake and not an ocean. I'm not sure exactly where the setting was, but it was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, The cinematography was amazing. It was very atmospheric and the setting really helped create this feeling of isolation, which contributed to the story in a very realistic way. And I love the juxtaposition between the beautiful landscapes and all the horrific events Mm. that keeps happening to this poor family. The visual and auditory experience that was Mm. created was so effective. And there was a few scenes towards the end that were just like really hard to watch and also hard to hear. Um, Once again, it's one of those films that's just like so visceral and just like really put you into the film and made you empathize with the characters. Uh, There is actually a very similar scene in this movie to a scene in The Dark and the Wicked that involves some fingers and a knife. Uh, There was also a similar scene in The Grudge. What the fuck? Yeah, we... Dark and the Wicked did have a scene with the fingers and the knife. Or yeah, am I it did. No, grudge? it did. And so did The Grudge. Okay. Like, I I literally watched both movies and was like, wait, what? What the fuck? Okay. Well, this movie has the exact same thing. So, yeah, okay. I don't know. <laughs> this is something that needs to be retired immediately. Right. People stop doing this. Um, and I don't know which movie was made first. So I don't know if anyone... Doesn't matter. ...copied anyone or if everyone just had, like, the same idea. Um, it's creepy, for sure, but yeah, I don't need to see it for a fourth time. Uh, <laughs> so the little boy that played Luke from The Haunting of Hill House, uh, he's in this movie, and he also has like the big Coke bottle glasses, oh, and no, he's watch it. He's so totally cute. adorable. Um, and there's a really good cameo from Tommy Chong that I appreciated. Um, Nick Cage is, I mean, he's so Nick Cagey. In this yeah. movie, which is like a total treat to watch. Um, so, yeah, I totally recommend this movie. Um, let me know when you watch it, Mindy. I really want to hear your opinion on it. I will eventually. Yeah. Um, cool. Oh, my God. I love that little boy in his biggest glasses. He's so cute. Speaking of tropes that I'm sort of done with, um, I did watch The Other Lamb um, on Hulu, which stars... Uh, Raffi Cassidy from uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, Snow White and the Huntsman, and Dark Shadows. Um, some newbie, uh, is it Michael K- Huseman? Houseman? Huseman? I'm joking. It's the dude from Treme, The Invitation, or from Black, Game of Thrones, uh, Hill House, Mike from Hill, our friend that we love, the writers from Hill House, The Haunting of Hill House, The Oldest Brother. The actor from The Invitation. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. Sorry. Not to like be all blunt. Michelle Huseman? I was joking about the name. Yeah, I think it's Michael. But how do you say it? But I don't know if it's Michael. We've said it before. I think it's Michael Huseman, but. I never said it. In any case, he's awesome. We've seen him before. We like him. That was really the only reason I stuck around for this movie. Um, And then. for you gamers out there, Denise uh, Groff, I'm going to go with, um, who was in The Fall uh, and 
has I get a big voice role in Mass Effect Andromeda and The Witcher 3, which are big video games. Um, a bit the plot. A girl born into an all-female cult led by a man in their compound begins to question his teachings and her own reality. So I think I've got to get off the cult train for a while. And that's cult train, not cult train, just to be clear. Um, We just researched cults and I binged Seduced, which is the Nexium documentary about uh, India Oxenberg, daughter of Catherine uh, who fought to get India out of the cult and deprogrammed. And then I watched this movie and I didn't quite realize, I guess, that it was going to essentially be like a movie, ver- an artsy movie version of the same themes I've been watching in real life. Visually, it was lovely and seemed kind of timeless, actually. Like the style was, a uh, style of dress was very Puritan, with long, heavy dresses, button to the necks, bonnets, etc. Um, our buddy from... The Haunting of Hill House is the leader of the all-female cult. And he's always really great, including in this. But he creeped me the fuck out because he made me feel icky, which was expected given the subject matter because he's a cult leader. But in that respect, it was well done. But it just, ugh. But I'm just so over megalomaniac white dudes who surround themselves with a harem of women, yes men, and a god complex, both in film and real life. So I wasn't a huge fan of this one, but it sounds, if it sounds like this is your jam, like just go for it. Full disclosure for hardcore horror fans, this movie's more of a psychological thriller than a horror. That's not a diss, but if you're in the mood for something scarier, maybe look elsewhere. I take full responsibility for you watching this because I was like, hey Mindy, this movie, The Other Lamb, sounds like it's up your alley. I know. I think I because it was so close to other <laughs> subjects, I was like, I'm done with this particular theme. But it was good. I mean, it was well done. I'm just kind of done with that gross stuff. Of Yeah, I think I'll skip this one. Um, yeah. I would honestly maybe skip the next one if I was <laughs> recommending it. I kind it. of did. Sorry. Um, so the next movie I'm going to be talking about is something we've talked about um the beginning of this year, Vivarium, starring Imogene Poots and Jesse Eisenberg. It's about a young couple that is thinking about buying their starter home. And to this end, they visit a real estate agency where they are received by a strange sales agent who accompanies them to a new, mysterious, peculiar housing development to show them a single family home. There they get trapped in a surreal maze like nightmare. A little bit of trivia the title is Latin for, quote, place of life, end quote. It also alludes to an area usually enclosed for keeping and raising animals or plants for observation or research. Often a portion of the ecosystem for a particular species is simulated on a smaller scale with controls for environmental conditions. Mm. Um, So that will give you a lot of insight into the film. However, even knowing that, This movie, I just thought was more style than substance. I really did not understand what the overall message of this movie was, (laughs) what they were trying to convey, or the motivation behind the plot. Um, So basically, there's a lot of things that are a part of the story that just never get explained. And I just feel like there's really something lacking in the storyline. There's a lot of plot holes, which... Once again, horror movies, we've talked about this in the past, horror movies, you expect a few plot holes because obviously a lot of horror movies defy reality, but if there's too many, it just, it doesn't hold up. The mo- the, the whole story, the whole movie just cannot hold up if there's too many plot holes. So personally, I think this movie would have been better as a short film, like a Twilight Zone episode or an episode of Black Mirror. Um, There's a lot of people who have said that, and I agree with them. So I honestly wouldn't really recommend this movie. Gotcha. I would just like to point out there's a difference between plot holes and suspension of disbelief for a horror film. I think that there are two different things. And if you are not fleshing out or, or giving it sufficient backup, for the audience to, I guess, suspend their disbelief, then that's kind of on you as like the storyteller, which that's a technical term, backup. (laughs) But I kind of feel like that's 
also relevant in a way to our next film, which is, I think, our final film we're going to talk about, right? This is the final film we're going to talk about. And you're right. I honestly, I don't know. Maybe, maybe plot holes isn't the best term I should have used there. There is just a lot of unanswered questions right. that I thought this movie had. And you're you're exactly right. It's, it's not so much plot holes as it is bad storytelling, right. unfortunately. Like, Good Night Mommy had a lot of things that were really not explained or clear or vague or whatever and it didn't fucking matter but the lodge i think there were a few decisions that i was like are you on drugs why are you making this decision as a human so there's a very distinct difference so let's talk about our final film antebellum which i like waited to watch to like the very end um it stars of course janelle monet shout out to fans of her music um, she's also movie wise been in Hidden Figures, Moonlight, and Harriet, and she's uh, on Amazon's second season of the show Homecoming. Eric Lang, uh, who is on HBO's Perry Mason reboot, as well as The Man in the High Castle, Lost, and tons of other stuff. Jenna Malone, who, aside from the Hunger Games movies, uh, she was in Saved, as you mentioned earlier. Well, that you mentioned, I think, in part one, Sharon, and the movie Inherent Vice, and is just rad. And Jack Houston, who, fun fact, is Angelica Houston's nephew, but who also literally portrayed the greatest fucking TV character ever, Richard Harrow from Bardrock Empire. What up, fans of that show? He's a genius. All right, I'm sorry, but Special Agent Dale Cooper is the greatest TV character No, like, ever. you should see what this fucking dude does with half a fucking face, and I'm not even kidding. Like, it's amazing, but... I don't give a fuck. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, underrated actor. Basically, my point is, there's a shit ton load of talent behind this movie, so keep that in mind as I continue. Okay, so the basic plot pulled from IMDb, successful author Veronica Henley finds herself trapped in a horrifying reality that forces her to confront the past, present, and future before it's too late. Uh, just a little bit of trivia because maybe not everyone's aware. Uh, the word antebellum is a Latin term uh, generally describing a period of time leading up to a war, but more commonly referring to the time before the American Civil War which was pre-1861, and the age of slavery in particular. So this is a loaded one for me. Um, directors uh, Gerard Bush and Christopher Rentz stated that they actually, this is kind of amazing, acquired the fucking lenses used to shoot the film God and with the Wind from 1939, which if you don't know what that is, I actually wrote like a general description, but fucking Google it and learn what Gone with the Wind is because you should know. <laughs> um, but their point, the whole point was that they wanted to show, they wanted to create the same feel of that movie, but at the same time, quote, correct it by showing a more accurate depiction of the antebellum period, especially the treatment of slaves. So, Sharon, I have a brief version of how I felt about this movie. If you, <laughs> if you want me to go first, it literally is brief. Sure, go for it. I fucking love the message. I did not like the execution. For me, um, slight spoiler if anybody fucking cares about Star Wars The Force Awakens, but this made me feel like if I were in the, the pitch where J.J. Ab like in the pitch meeting where J.J. Abrams was like, okay, so I'm going to make this the new, the sequel to arguably the most famous trilogy of all time. And it's going to be just like A New Hope, but with like a black dude. I would be like, stop right there. When you say just like X, but with Y, people are going to linger on the X. And for me, this movie is too much like a repeated theme that is very popular and famous by another means that it disappointed me because the talent and the message were so fucking important and good that I already have spoken to people who literally were like, yeah, I have no desire in watching that because I know blah, 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 blah. So that was very disappointing to me that said, fucking everyone's amazing in it. And like, I know Jenna Malone in particular, she played her role, I thought, to a T, to a crucifying effect, I will say. And Janelle Monet, I will love till the day I die. And I think it goes without saying that she's just a genius. And that shows in her acting as well. 
I just really fucking wish we would get more originality going. Anyway, Sharon, what are your thoughts on this? And yeah, go ahead. All right, my first thought is you and I have different definitions of brief. Because <laughs> that oh, was you not saw brief. what I wrote originally. So. I know. I was like, I'm done. I'm done talking. Oh. You talk now. Okay. Um. Obviously, as you said, cast is great. Janelle Monae's performance captivating as usual. Mm. Didn't expect anything less from her. Gabrielle Sidibe was very entertaining as her best friend and also the comic relief in the movie, uh, which is uh, deals with a very heavy subject. Jenna Malone, who I normally love, mm. she played such a despicable character in the movie. Um, I fucking hated her character, but she did it very well. She's amazing, um, yeah. So I feel like I really should have seen the twist coming in the movie, but I didn't until it was almost revealed. Spencer figured it out like right away and I know you did as well um I do really appreciate that this movie was trying to make a statement about the racial unrest in our country uh going on today that's always been going on but now it's just you know it's basically the forefront of what's going on every day in the news uh it's a very important message and absolutely something that needs to be talked about I think Get Out Mm. did that so brilliantly this movie was just a lot more in your face about it the plantation scenes in the film were brutal and horrifying that's the reality of what happened and you you know this country likes to sugarcoat all that like it wasn't so bad and then they were freed and everything was fine not the fucking case um i liked the movie for what it was it definitely held my intention the entire time visually striking and like that's a great trivia that they used the same camera that they used in gone with the wind like the actual Um, fucking lenses they acquired it which is like mike flanagan level like detail Detail, yeah that's crazy so interesting i did think this movie lacked a backstory (laughs) i mean that was like you you needed a backstory like the how the why Mm -hmm. the logistics of the whole thing like none of that made sense and also my takeaway from this film is that i need to start doing yoga because yoga (laughs) may save my life one day right so moving on what sharon may i ask what were your top three picks from 2020 for movies? Uh, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone that <laughs> The Hunt <laughs> is on that list. Uh, I'm also going to say uh, VFW, Swallow, and His House and Possessor are, mm. are also... I mean, honestly, it's kind of hard yeah. to, to pick. But I would have to say those five... Are definitely my top picks. Uh, Those five are your top three. That's great. We were asking for three, but cool. Oh, I can't. No, I one hundred percent agree with you. <laughs> Technically, I have four. So okay. All right. What are, What are your top three? Well, Sharon pre-wrote my list, so I'm gonna read as I responded. My top three picks were your ma because she dies tomorrow. Your butt is scarier than murder in the woods, but it's also tied with VFW because your face is as fucked up as Possessor. What, what? (laughs) I love Possessor. I think that might be my top pick, quite frankly. That, the ending to that, I feel like I should be more emotionally appalled, but I'm just so fucking blown away that it overpowers everything. I've never seen anything like it. Okay, so how about the suckers? What are your top three picks? Or bottom three picks, sorry. I I mean, The Turning, for sure. The Grudge and Fantasy Island. Um, I mean, honestly, I was was very, very close to putting She Dies Tomorrow on my bottom. But at least that's an original story, whereas The Turning, The Grudge, and Fantasy Island. Been done before, not original. You know, it's either a reboot, a remake, or... A fucking whatever disaster, horrible, <laughs> right? Skip, skip, okay, so the grudge and those, the grudge and fantasy island made my list as well. I'm gonna also toss on there the other lamb simply because I think I've reached, like I said, cult overload, and it grossed me out seeing an actor I really like playing a creepy cult leader icky dude. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, 2020 horror wise in a nutshell. 
(laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you all for listening to us. Uh, As always, you can write to us at whorestalkwhore at gmail.com. Once again, we want to know what your favorite and least favorite horror movies of 2020 are. Also, please send us any ghost stories, true crime stories, UFO stories. Tell us about the one time you swap bodies with a serial killer or, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to share with us. Except no cult stories because Mindy's over cult shit for a while. <laughs> Unless you got like dirt on Nexium and Keith Raniere because like that dude's an asshole. Anyway. Aren't you done with that shit yet? Ugh. This is done with that after four episodes of The Vow. Well, I watched that India show, which showed even worse shit that he said. Like, he's awful. Anyway. Please subscribe to us and rate and review us. It helps us get a lot more exposure on any podcast streaming site, um, especially Apple Podcasts. If you do listen to us on Apple, please make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us there. If you are able to, you can join our Patreon if you want to get early access to episodes, hear and see exclusive content, and maybe get some cool shit from us. By the way, we will have the complete list of movies that we watch in our episode description for your convenience. Um, So you're welcome. (laughs) Please be kind to each other. Be safe. And let's finally fucking end this year. Fuck yes. Uh, fingers crossed that 2021 will be much better of a year for everyone. I mean, how can it possibly don't, be fucking don't worse? Don't ask. Don't ask that question. We don't want to know. You're right. All right. I'm knocking on wood. I don't right? want to jinx us. All right. Totally. Um, but yeah, happy New Year's to everyone. Our next episode will be in 2021. See you in Woo. the future. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So cheers. Let's do a little toast right now. Woo! Cheers to a a better fucking year. Hell yeah. God damn it. And as always, thanks, thanks for, for getting, getting creepy, creepy with, with us. us. Sharon, do you want a beer? Uh, oh my god.